it's a familiar scene. Someone is lost in Canada's wilderness. A local group of volunteers assemble, including search dogs and their handlers. It's a race against the elements and a race against time. Whether a person is lost in the woods, buried in rubble, or covered by an avalanche of snow, the fundamentals of training a search dog remain the same. GSAR, USAR, avalanche dogs. We're looking at the same uh, type of dogs. We all start out with the same initial skill set of searching for human odor. And then what we do is we specialize the dog to a certain niche that we want them. USAR, of course, it's rubble. Uh, so we take that dog and we add the skill set of them being able to maneuver over a rubble pile. Carta, for instance, they take that same search and rescue dog that we have and they add the skill set of being able to search the snow. You would not take a paramedical dog and expect them to work 12 hours doing search and rescue, especially if it was in, uh, say, for avalanche work because it's totally different drives and you find that out through testing. The dog and the handler are partners. You're looking together. That whole validation search, a significant part of it is them working together. The handler's out there looking for clues. The dog's out there looking for clues. So this is a partnership. This isn't a tool you send out there, uh, you know, like a robot to find something. This is your partner. dog team faces a much more specialized level of training when searching for people trapped in collapsed structures and debris. In Brandon, Manitoba, there is a facility and program dedicated to training search dogs and their handlers in the unique environment of urban search and rescue. USAR teams respond to disasters in urban areas where they could face any number of hazards. As a dog handler on the urban search and rescue team, I would be the one who directs my dog around the rubble pile in a fashion where I'm covering each quadrant and I direct him to locate missing people. I will go to where he's indicating to check it out. We could be training on a USAR pile. There might be 10 of us as a team and we're all moving around. That's all odor that's you know, you would think would be distracting the dog, but the dog's able to pinpoint an odor that's different than the group he's with. And the dog zeroes in on that and goes for it. Storm, one of his qualities is being very loyal to a certain few. He's such a friendly dog that I am so happy that he has that disposition because I can take him anywhere with me. He's just a pleasure to work with. He's been very healthy and he and Maxine work, work very well together. She's a very high energy handler and is, is very motivated to, to be there and do a good job. And, and he's the same way, he follows her lead. The dogs on our team, right now, the majority of them have come from rescue shelters. Um, the reason for that is, is that we could go to a recognized breeder, but there are lots of um, good dogs that have, for a variety of reasons, have ended up in shelters. A rescue dog isn't necessarily an abused dog, um, but a dog that hasn't been the right fit for a family who goes into a shelter for adoption to its, its future home. What happens to a dog in a shelter is that if a home is not found for the dog, eventually they are put down. So that's a great place for us to start looking for a dog. For search and rescue, uh, for a lot of detection profiles like explosive detection or drug detection, we're looking for a high drive, um, Labrador, Golden Retriever, Shepherd, um, that is just a sociable dog with an incredibly high drive. So a dog like that, we can go to a, a shelter and, and certainly look and, and test some dogs. Part of the reason why people don't take dogs like Storm, as beautiful as he is, these dogs have energy. You can tell they want to work. They're very intelligent, but they have all this pent-up energy. So they're not great as a family pet because 
all they need, dogs like that, they need a job. I think the big thing about these dogs, whether they're working or not, these are happy dogs. These, these dogs are, are so well cared for. Um, they're so glad to have a job that is able to use all their instincts and, and all their abilities. The work that they put in is, is such an integral part of their personality. Um, and because they're so happy working, that when they're, when they're off the job, they still, they're still happy. They're crazy, energetic dogs. You know, they, they, they need somebody to run them all the time, for sure. Good boy! Since the day I saw Storm, I knew he was a special dog. He deserved this opportunity, and he deserved this chance to work and not only to work, but to be loved and a part of a family. And he's got the whole package now. At some point in time, all these dogs give you that validation and that sign that thank you so much for rescuing me. And you just feel it from them. You're such a good boy. Good boy. Touch your neck. That's so nice. Dogs, yeah, they're all about the game, but they are also about caring because they know how to give you that feeling of whether it's the way they look at you or actually jump up and hug you or just kind of lean up against you. It's just that feeling of thank you so much for giving me a chance and this opportunity to work because they haven't been given that chance by anybody before. And it's like those thank you moments that you get from them that mean the world to me. The Canadian Avalanche Rescue Dog Association work with dog teams for search and rescue in some of the most beautiful but dangerous mountains in the world. Here in the Rockies and the Columbia Mountains, avalanches are a constant threat. Members of CARTA are always on alert. Training at high altitudes is hard work, and to keep their dogs motivated, Carta's JP teaches handlers a frantic, high-energy reward. Jay is uh, our puppy instructor for Carta. He just makes it really fun for you and your dog, and you want it. It's supposed to be fun. If it's not fun, then you shouldn't be doing it because for the dog, it's it's fun. So you're not totally out of breath. When we rewarded a puppy, he just didn't do it right. <laughs> what we use is a tug of war. We hold out a, a long piece of rag for the dogs. They grab it, they shake it back and forth. Uh, there's a special way of doing it. And what's happening here in the wolf part of their mind is now they've made the kill. So it's very instinctual. Uh, it's, uh, and it's somewhat ironic too when you think about it. We're teaching the dogs to save lives by utilizing this instinct. So that's something that the dogs must have, is the hunting prey drive. If they don't have that, they were born to do something else. Having this opportunity with Carter, yeah, it, it was a no-brainer for me. It's something that I've always wanted to do, and, and they've just given me the time to be able to work the dog, and then working with Jay all the time, and working with you know so many other handlers who have just, I've been extremely lucky to, to have that opportunity. Griffin is a co-worker and a partner and a friend. He is all of the above. To me, he's family. I can pretty much talk to him like I would talk to a human. Uh, he just doesn't talk back. And because of his high drive, he really wants to please me all the time. He's been really easy to train, because um, I was learning to, and he's just made it super easy, because he's just kind of does everything I ask of him and kind of does it with such intensity. It's different. Everybody's got a different personality. Every dog has a different personality. And the way you interact with the dog and your training style, you know, has to reflect on that dog's personality. It's been really rewarding seeing Kai learn. Um, it's been extremely frustrating too when, when you, you do something for the 60th time and he just He's just having a bad day, or, or I haven't quite caught how to teach him it, I should say. But yeah, it's, it's been really rewarding and extremely, extremely difficult. 
It's quite a lot of work the first couple years. It takes two years to train your dog, so it's, it's a lot of work and the training's more intense the first couple years. So it does take a lot of time, but it is something that we all volunteer and do on the side. We all have other jobs and, and are busy in our own lives, but we definitely have to train our dogs a few times a week. I think to be a, a CARTA dog handler, you have to be passionate about the training constantly because if you're not having fun, the dog's not having fun. And the whole goal of our mission is to be able to save a life, but the dog doesn't really necessarily realize that. The dog is in it to play a game, and the reward of his game is to have fun. The people that come into this, if they want to do this, they should be involved in the mountain industry. They should either be a ski patrol, uh, perhaps a guide, or works for highways and transportation. In other words, they should be in some position where after all this training, they are actually going to be in a position to respond to a call. We don't do this because our pets need something to do. This is life and death. There is a lot of situations where obviously it's time dependent. We all know that with search and rescue for us to, in an avalanche scenario, if I'm right there and it happens in front of me and my dog's with me, then you have a better opportunity of finding that person if they don't have any gear. And even if they do, dogs in general, are still extremely quick at, at finding people. So yeah, having a, um, a dog involved in your search and rescue program is key for us to be successful. Sergeant Dwayne Rutledge of the New Glasgow Police Department is a police service dog handler. His canine partner is Eco, who arrived in Nova Scotia from the Czech Republic seven years ago. After a bit of a rocky start, Dwayne and Eco have developed a strong relationship. I wasn't very impressed. He was not a very friendly dog. He, they wheeled him off an airplane in a crate, and uh, all you could see in the dark crate was a set of teeth, and you could hear him growling at me. So uh, neither one of us had any training, so it was a little rough. <laughs> sort of, it was a little unnerving for me because I'd never owned a dog like that, and I really wasn't what I was expecting. So. You know, I'm used to family dogs, and that was a huge departure from what I was used to. We have six disciplines where, that the dog is trained in. Obedience, tracking, searching, big article, small article, searching buildings, uh, uh, aggression, and drug searching. Suspect, stand still! Keep on heel! It's a tremendous uh, searcher for narcotics. Uh, he's been a good tracker for us. His obedience is tremendous control on him to do what you tell him to do because he's been well disciplined and he's, he's obedient. And that's simply from a lot of training. Uh, he was a, an excellent searcher too for our animals. Uh, so, good all around dog. We're very happy with him. There's things we solve that you just wouldn't solve without him. You could have 20 people searching a, a field for spent shells. That if you don't get those shells, you can't match them to a gun, which will then match you to a suspect, where a dog can do that same job in 20 minutes. So you go out and you find the weapon plus the shells that were stolen. You know, what's the value of that? We haven't got a bunch of kids now finding a gun, accidentally shooting some. Like, so, you know, those types of things are nice. You know, it makes you feel good that you're able to aid in that. Those are nine millimeter shells we search for. So you think your chances of finding that out here? 